Well, friends, I'm thrilled to kick off a brand new series of messages with you this morning. Would you pray with me as we open God's Word? Lord, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and speak to us today uh, through your Word. Lord, anoint me to preach your Word with clarity and with unction and with, uh, with power as it should be preached. Uh, anoint us to hear and to receive and to lean into you and to apply this Word to our heart, God, so that we might follow you through this holy season. Uh, we pray, gracious God, there be spiritual breakthroughs. We pray that you'd break down the walls that we have built between us and you, that we'd see you, Jesus, uh, in a fresh new way. In your holy name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Hey, we're going to be camping out in the gospel according to John through this season of Lent, looking specifically at the last days of, of Jesus. You know, John is uh, unique among the Gospels. You may know there are four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four biographies of Jesus in the Bible, in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. That means that they look alike. They, they, they follow the same outline. They follow the same pattern. Mark was probably written first, and Matthew put a little spin on it for a Jewish audience, and Luke put a little spin on it for a, a Gentile audience. But we have a lot of overlap, but unique things in each one. John's Gospel is called the Other Gospel. He doesn't really seem to follow the timeline of the others. He doesn't seem to be that interested in timeline. It's more of a theological look at who is Jesus. And he tells us in John chapter 20 why he wrote what he wrote. He said, uh, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. In fact, it will say at the end, if I wrote down everything he did, the world could not contain the books. Jesus lived a big life. There's lots of things you could have wrote about. Lots of amazing things he said. Lots of amazing things he's done. He couldn't write it all down. Uh, as somebody that followed with Jesus and, and, uh, and was a, a very close friend with Jesus. But he said, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. John says, here's why I wrote what I wrote. I want you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I want you to believe he's the Son of God. And I want you to have life in the name of Jesus. So he crafted his gospel to that end and to that aim. Now, we can kind of look at a little outline of John's gospel. Very simple outline. You know, uh, John starts out different than any other gospel. He doesn't give us the birth of Jesus. doesn't give us Bethlehem. None of that. He gives us a theological look. In the beginning was the Word, this, this Logos hymn. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. He's full of grace and truth. He came to give us the power to become the children of God. And then Bible scholars call it uh, the first big section, the book of signs. He's giving signs of who he is and his identity. And a lot of these things are revealed in conversation. There's a lot of conversations in John's gospel. Conversation with, uh, you know, there's, there's the sign of the water into wine. Then there's the conversation with Nicodemus, chapter 3. Chapter 4, the conversation with the, with the woman at the well. And he's interspersing these great I am sayings that are only found in John's gospel. I am, the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. And um, the, the last greatest um, sign he gives is uh, the raising of Lazarus, where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. We're going to look in the wake of that um, uh, to, today is in, in our reading. Um, but John has 22 chapters, okay? 11 of those chapters are dedicated to the last six days of Jesus' life. Now let's just say here, Jesus had a three-year earthly ministry. Three years worth of material there. John's going to spill half his ink on the last six days of Jesus. And what's he trying to tell us here? These events are weighty. These events are important. Things happen that are necessary for us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and to have life in His name. We need to pay attention to these deeds. There's a big block of teaching material there that we don't get in any of the other Gospels. But we're going to look at some of the deeds, the act. What happened to Jesus and what did He walk through and what did He go through those last few days of his life. That's going to be our focus. And this, uh, the second half there of John's Gospel, scholars call it the book of glory. And the book of glory overlaps with the story of Jesus' passion. 
So the passion is the glory, and the glory is the passion. Okay, and so uh, that's why we're calling this series the, the Passion and the Glory. They go together. The passion of Jesus is the glory of Jesus. So I'm going to invite you to stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to invite our um, worship leaders to come up at this time, and they're going to bring that reading to us. Hear the Word of God from the Gospel according to John's selections from chapters 11 and 12. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus, what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jews' nation. And not only for the nation, but only, but also for the sacrifice sacred children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, uh, they plotted to take his life. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Beth Bethany, where Lourdes lived, whom Jesus had raised from, raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lourdes was among those resealing at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint, a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. So these events that were read for us follow on the heels of one of Jesus' most spectacular miracles. And uh, John tells us that this miracle really was the precipitating event for Holy Week and for the death of Jesus uh, it was, that was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. I don't have time to do the story justice. This is your homework this week. Go back and read all of John chapter 11 because uh, it, it, it's, it's such an amazing and a human and just, just, it's, just, it's just good. The whole thing is good and it's powerful and it's necessary. Jesus and his disciples are uh, down by the Jordan River uh, where the area where John would, had been baptizing earlier and uh, they got news while they were down there from Mary and Martha that their brother Lazarus was sick and, uh, and they wanted Jesus to come and heal him. Now, these were people that were very, very close to Jesus. Uh, these were his very, very good friends. He knew them very well. Uh, Jesus delayed to go. And the disciples didn't want to go at all because it was considered a very dangerous thing to do. The heat was getting hotter and hotter in the kitchen, so to speak. And there was an active plot against Jesus' life by the religious leaders. He could be arrested. There were a lot of things that could have happened. None of them good. And so the disciples really didn't thought that's the reason they weren't going. But then Jesus, a couple days after, after delaying a couple days, says, we're going to go wake Lazarus up. And they said, well, if he's sleeping... Let's not wake him up. Let's let, let's let the poor man rest. But Jesus, of course, knew that he had died and he was going to wake him up from death. And, um, and so uh, just want to kind of explain uh, the geography here a little bit. Uh, we got Bethany here. Now, this is Jerusalem that you see. That's the temple courts there. 
Bethany is just right on the other side of the Mount of Olives from, from Jerusalem. So if the Quad Cities is Jerusalem, Bethany is Kelowna or Silvus, very, very close in the same in the same metropolitan area, it's kind of a suburb, if you will. This is where Jesus would stay when he was going to uh, Jerusalem for the required religious festivals, Passover and such. Uh, he would stay with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and, and he and his disciples would go over into the city during the day and then come back at night. And uh, it, was, it was the same area. And this was the hotbed of religious leadership. This was, the, this was the people that were plotting most actively against their life. And so, you know, this was a very considered a very dangerous thing to go to Bethany because it was in the environments of, of environs of Jerusalem. And, and Thomas, the apostle Thomas, always the optimist, his, his comment at this point when Jesus said we're going to Bethany, he said, well, well let's go die with him, I guess. <laughs> This is not going to go well. This is, you know, let's just go die with him. And so they, they come to, to Bethany, and, and you had Mary and Martha, their sisters. I won't ask for a show of hands, but there might be one or two people that have a sibling that is the polar opposite of them in personality. I don't know. I'm looking for some heads to nod here. Some of you have that. You have a sibling that's just wired up different. That's Mary and Martha for you. They were very opposites in, in some ways. Okay, Uh, Martha was a very practical person. Uh, She was a doer. She had a serving heart. We get a little glimpse of the dynamic with Mary and Martha with another dinner party that was told in in Scripture uh, that, uh, you know, they went to Mary and Martha's house and Martha's up cooking dinner for, she's got 13 hungry men to feed. I mean, she's got a big crowd to feed. And Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus with the men listening to what Jesus had to say. And Martha comes in and says, Jesus, would you please tell my sister to get off her, to get up and help me with dinner? And Jesus uh, said, "Uh, Martha, Martha. (laughs) Now, Jesus loved Martha. There's nothing wrong with being a Martha, okay? Okay. The world would fall apart without Martha's. We need, we need Martha's. Jesus loved Martha as much as he loved Mary, but he says Mary's chosen the better part, and I'm not going to take it away from her. Uh, Martha's, are, Martha's, we need Martha's, just like we need Mary's. I tell you what, we were in St. Louis a, few, uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, we had uh, Dave and Marilyn Blair with us. And uh, Mary, we, we said, we kind of want to eat at the church rather than go out to eat, save some money. And, and Martha said, I got this. She, she'd made homemade spaghetti sauce. She froze it and took it with us. And it was good, wasn't it? And, and we, she needed a place to cook. We went up to, upstairs to the church, to the church kitchen. And uh, the janitor kind of showed us where it was. And she kind of touched the pots and pans. And she said, I got this. I said, well, do you need some help? She <laughs> Kind of like a plumber told me one time. I asked plumber, how much do you charge? He said, it's $100 an hour unless you help. And then it's $200 an hour. <laughs> and, uh, and, and she said, nope, I, I got this. And she just did the whole thing, and it was delicious, and it was good. You could tell she was just in her element, you know. And God bless people like that. God bless practical people. And some of you maybe feel a little inferior because you come to church, and, and you're there, and the music started, and you're... you're, you're you know, worshiping in your own way, and there's somebody next to you there, oh, man, they're, you know, they're, their tears are down there. They're going down their eyes, and they're, it's like, I don't, whatever that gear is, I don't have that gear, you know. I just don't, that's not who I am. That's not, you know, you think, well, maybe, is, am, I, am I wrong? Am I something wrong with me? No, it's just, it's just the Mary and Martha thing, okay? You can worship in your own way. Spiritual things are more natural than some people, but Jesus loves practical people, too. And he's going to talk to Martha and he loved them both. And he's going to talk to Mary and Martha. And they're going to express some disappointment. They said, Jesus, if you'd just been here sooner, you could have saved my brother. And, of course, that gives Jesus the opportunity to say one of the great I am sayings in the book of John. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And he goes to the tomb of his good friend Lazarus. The shortest verse in the Bible is there in John chapter 11. You know, can you quote it? Jesus wept. 
Now, you can't use that, guys, for your confirmation verse on April 22nd when you memorize a Bible verse. That one's outlawed. It's too, too easy. It's too easy. Why did Jesus weep? Well, it's his friend had died. He's facing death, uh, even though he knows what he's going to do there. He's looking at a tomb very much like the tomb that he himself will be in in a few days. And so he's confronted by the reality of death there. But he says those famous words, Lazarus, <laughs> you know, he, he said, roll the stone away. And they, they objected. This, the, the smell's not going to be pleasant, Jesus. He's been in there four days. Um, you know, kind of how it would work is they had these rock cut tombs. They were used over and over again. Um, you'd put the body in there, you'd roll the, roll the stone over, and, you know, about six, eight months would go by, and the body would dry out and turn, decompose into bones, and you'd open the tomb, and you'd scoop up the bones, you'd put them in a little box called an ossuary, uh, usually with their name engraved on it, and that would be buried separately. But the tomb was used over and over again. But you didn't open it up on day four. You open it up on several months later. But Jesus said, no, open it up, and he gives those words... Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus hops out of it. He's bound up in the linen cloths. And he comes hopping out of the tomb. Now, um, a few things immediately um, happen. And this gets us to our reading today. The Sanhedrin call a meeting. Because people had seen this. And they couldn't deny it. This guy was dead. We went to his funeral. And we, we saw his body being wrapped up, and it was in there four days, and then now he's alive, he's walking around, and they, they believed in Jesus, but some went and told the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the, the Sanhedrin was a group of 70 religious leaders that ran the whole show in Jerusalem. And they didn't always get along with one another, but they agreed, we're in charge, and we're going to maintain order. We're the religious court, we're the religious leaders. And they didn't like upstart religious movements like John the Baptist. They, they didn't like that. They weren't in control of it. Some people will throw rocks at anything they're not in control of. And they weren't in control of Jesus' movement either. And so they, they saw it as a threat because, hey, if people go crazy and try to crown some guy from Nazareth king or something, the Romans are going to come in, they're going to take over, people are going to die. So it's really a safety issue. We need to be in control. We need to get a lid on this. And Caiaphas, the high priest, said, you know, it would be better if one man died instead of a lot of people die. And John says, you know, that was prophetic. Even though he was probably the least prophetic person you'd ever want to meet. He was the most political person you'd ever want to meet. But he actually said something prophetic as high priest. One person's going to die for all the people. Okay? That, that's, that, that gives us a program for the next few chapters of John's gospel. One person's going to die. Um, it's going to die for the people. Now, we didn't read a few verses in there. We had to kind of cut it short a little bit. But the part we didn't read said that Jesus went out into the wilderness with his disciples. It's almost like the heat immediately went back up in Jerusalem and, and, and Bethany. And Jesus and his disciples had to kind of dip out. It was not their time yet. It wasn't Jesus' time yet. And the, the debate was whether Jesus was ever going to come back. And it was getting to be Passover, six days before the Passover. And everybody was saying, is Jesus going to show back up again or is he not? And he does show up in Bethany six days before the Passover. And not just any Passover. This is the Passover at which Jesus would die. So things are really coming to a head now. We're getting, we're getting here to the, those last six days of Jesus' earthly life here in, in John's gospel. And there's a banquet in Jesus' honor. Now, it's almost like, and I almost get the impression here, that Mary and Martha and Lazarus did not get the opportunity to say thank you to Jesus in the way that they wanted to say thank you. So what was this banquet? I really think it was a thank you banquet for raising Lazarus from the dead. I think it was their way of saying, hey, we, wanna, we, we just can't thank you enough and we just want to have a dinner in your, in your honor. So Martha, uh, John tells us, was serving. That's her wheelhouse. That's her happy place. She's doing her thing. She knows what she's up to. She knows how to do this. And the men would have been at the table. Back then, the men would have been sitting at, at the table and the women would have been, so that's just how it was, you know. And even, you know, when I got married, uh, Becky's family, I went to Grandma's house for dinner and the men ate first and then the women ate. That's how they did it. And so I sacrificed and ate first, but I thought it was a little weird. 
you know, but I think it was just the size of grandma's kitchen. They had to do it in shifts, and they just always had done it that way. And uh, the, so just to give you a visual here, um, you know, sometimes we get a picture of the Last Supper, and they're all sitting in chairs around the table. That's not how they would have dined at all. Tables were about this high off the ground, and they um, would have uh, been seated on the floor, and there would have been cushions around the table. And so when you ate, you kind of were leaning on the cushion with your elbow, and you were eating what's on the table, and your feet were kind of just laid out behind you there. That, that's, how they, that's how they did A little different than what we do it, but that's how they did it. They just kind of lounged around the table there. And, uh, you know, uh, John tells us that Lazarus was there, who the previously dead Lazarus was, uh, was there. That was amazing, and people wanted to get a look at him. He became a celebrity. Jesus was there, the disciples were there, and Martha was serving, and um, something happens during that meal. Mary had something planned, and she wasn't just waiting at the table. She, she came in with a very deliberate act of love, of devotion. It was an over-the-top gesture that nobody quite knew what to do with. She brought a, a pint of expensive perfume. Now, a pint is a lot of perfume. A pint is about a, some of you got water bottles this morning. It's about that much. You know, perfume is meant to be like, you know, like it's not meant to, to you know, dump it on. And, uh, and this was a very expensive, it was nard, also known as spike nard. And it would have been imported from out east. Uh, the plant would have grown in the Himalayas region. And it, I had to Google all the, you know, I had to Google it. What, is, what does nard smell like? And the words that came up were uh, heavy, sweet, woody, musky. Okay? <clears throat> it was a perfume that... You know, there, was, uh, there were different uses for perfume. You know, at a di at dinner party, you might come in, they, they might have a servant wash the dust off your feet, and they might give you a little bit of, smell them, you know, to freshen up with. That would not have been unusual in this setting. The only, the only but what Mary did, she broke the whole bottle open, and she poured it out on Jesus' feet. Now, the only time you'd ever use that much perfume is like embalming a body. You know, you would wrap it up and pour the perfume on it so it wouldn't stink so much, and it was considered a nice thing to do. And this was, you know, Judas Iscariot gives us the value of this. He, he quoted the value. It says, it, the, the bottle of perfume was worth a, a year's wages to an average working man. So think five figures in our money, okay? This was... More expensive than any, more money than you'd ever spent on a bottle of perfume, or I've ever spent on a bottle of, of, of really nice. This was, this was very high end stuff. And um, she, pours the, she pours the whole thing out. Why did she have such an expensive bottle of perfume? These are humble people, you know. Um, this could have been her dowry, okay? You know, your parents provide you with a really nice thing that will be presented to your husband. It makes you more, it's part of the deal, you know, so you can get a good husband. You know, well, we're going to get a good dowry. We don't think, we, don't, we try not to think that way in our culture, but back then they did. It was, a, it was a business deal that families did together. There was a dowry that was involved. There was some money that was offered to make sure that there was a good, a good match made. So that could have represented her future. It could have been her for her own funeral. She had bought, you know, some people prearrange their funeral, and it may have been something that she bought when I die one day. Use it. It's interesting, you know, she didn't use it on her brother, you know, but here she brings it, and she breaks it open at the feet of Jesus, and the house is filled with the aroma. And I could just feel this because I'm the kind of person that you can ask the people that work with me here in the church office, I can't do smells and. Or, perfumes and colognes. I don't wear them. I can't. I, I just kind of go right to my head and just make my head want to explode. I mean, and sometimes, uh, you know, a very well-meaning person will light like a scented candle in the office and I have to come out and say, I'm sorry, whatever that is, it smells good, but it's killing me. I just can't. I just can't with that. 
Sometimes I'll hug somebody and I'll be wearing perfume or cologne before I preach. It's like, whoa, I got to muscle through this. I'm just very sensitive to that kind of thing. And, and the house was filled with this aroma of this, of this nard. And, and not only that, but Mary lets down her hair. Now, in this culture, a woman would have had long hair, but would have worn it tied up, or maybe a covering, or tied up in a bun in some ways. And letting your hair down was something you did at home with your husband. Okay, Hair was considered a very sensual thing, a sensual part of a woman's beauty, and reserved for her husband. And so, you know... Um, um, I, I've got a guy in the church here that waits for a country music reference every, every, uh, every, every sermon. You know, it's kind of take the ribbon from your hair kind of thing, you know. So there's my country music reference for the day. And, it, it, you know, it's kind of, a, it was considered something that was, you didn't do in public, you didn't do for everybody. And Mary unties her hair and wipes the feet of Jesus with her hair. Now, this is, this is a scene, am I right? I mean, this is a whole thing right here. This is the kind of thing that happens, and you're like at the dinner party. <laughs> Do I pretend like a whole bottle of perfume hasn't been just broken open here at dinner? Do I pretend like there's not a woman wiping the feet of Jesus with her hair right over there? Do I, you know... Where do, where do my eyes go? What do, I, what do I do? Do we return to dinner? Do I stop eating? Do I, do I keep eating? Do I, uh, you, know, it's, it's that, you know, it's that kind of thing. Now, Mary models for us, um, I don't suggest you do this necessarily, okay? Uh, I don't, don't bring your perfume to church. By, for, for the love of all that's holy, don't do this uh, next week at, at church, you know. Bring your most expensive perfume and just pour it out. And, but there is a, a model for, for worship here in Mary. There, she planned this. She prepared her heart. You know, when I'm, when I'm driving to church, I like to listen to lots of different media, lots of things. I like podcasts. I like, I like talk stuff and and, but I tell you what, when I, when I drive to church, I want to hear the worship songs when I'm driving to church. Because I, I, I need to get my heart ready. I need to get my, I need to get my pregame going, you know. For, uh, it's kind of like pre-workout. You know, you need, you, need to, you need to get that going. David said, David believed in this. He said, awake my soul, get ready. It's time to worship God. You know, a lot of the psalms are, come on, come on soul. It's time, to, it's time to get prepared. You're going to worship, you're going to worship God. There was a, there was a, a, a preparation. There's a sacrifice involved. You know, worship costs something. David say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't offer God anything that didn't cost me something. Because there's, there's a cost. There's a cost of time. You're, you're giving of your time to be in worship today. You're, you're, there's a book about worship called A Royal Waste of Time. It's a spectacle, worship is. It, you know, um, there's a self-forgetfulness in worship. We kind of leave ourselves and we put our focus on God. And, um, and, and this, was, this was worship for her. Okay? Now, who's going to talk first? You know, somebody's going to have to say something about this. And it was our good friend Judas Iscariot. This is the first one to speak up here about this. He's got, he's got an expert analysis on this. And he says, why the waste what that could have been sold for a year's wages, and that money could have fed a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of poor people, you know. And uh, you know, John has some opinions about Judas Iscariot. It's obvious, and he's writing here. You know, some people try to redeem Judas a little bit. Like, why did Judas do what he did? Well, maybe, how could somebody that traveled with Jesus betray Jesus? And some people's like, well, you know what? He believed Jesus was the Messiah, and he, uh, and he, things weren't moving along in that direction. So he was trying to bring things to a head, you know, increase the conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. So Jesus would step into that role. And I think John would say baloney. The man was greedy. Money had his heart. You think, well, if you were a greedy person, why would you sign up to be a disciple of Jesus? That wasn't like a paying, a paying thing. But, 
you know, if you had an earthly Messiah in mind that Jesus is going to be in charge of Israel and he's going to need a few good men underneath him, that he might have seen that as a, as a, as a role to advancement. And when that wasn't working out, he, you know, he uh, abandoned uh, Jesus out of his disappointment. He wasn't going to be an earthly Messiah. He was going to be a spiritual uh, Messiah. But, but he, he, he said this was a waste. Why, why the waste? Uh, money had his heart. You know, to a, to a greedy person, generosity always seems insane. If you're a greedy person, if money has your heart, an act of gen- you give what to the church? You just give it, you just give like hundreds of dollars a month to the church. You just, it doesn't make any sense to them. And with Jesus, he, he said so much about the choice that our hearts have. We're either going to love God or we're going to love money. You, you can't do both at the same time. The love of money is the root of what? It's the, it's the root of all kinds of evil. We're told in, uh, in uh, Peter tells us that. And Jesus said, be on your guard. You can't serve God and mammon. And, and Judas had made his, his choice here. Anybody watch the Super Bowl last week? Uh, we had confirmation, but I got home, I turned, it on, turned on the game and watched it, and I didn't really have a dog in that fight. I didn't really care who won or anything. It was just, you know, just Super Bowls on. But the very next day, I missed the, there was an ad about Jesus. Did anybody see the, uh, he gets us ad? Did you see that? Uh, I tell you what, my Facebook friends are a lot of preachers from all over the country, and a lot, of, I got like 5,000 Facebook friends. I get a lot of, just a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of opinions out there, okay, about, about, about religious things. And the number one thing I saw about that, I didn't see the ad, was, well, a Super Bowl ad cost $200,000 a second. A lot of things could have been done with that money, you know. And um, I guess so, you know. Um, my response is, well, you could be doing, you could go now. And feed the poor, you know, instead of by sitting on Facebook, griping about with somebody else. You could be, <laughs> Janet Vandershaft told me that she used to go to Haiti all the time. And, and people would complain. They said, well, you're going all the way to Haiti to do stuff that is people in East Dab, you know, in, in uh, West Davenport that need, need help. And she said, have you gone to West Davenport to, <laughs> to help them? Well, no. Well, then, <laughs> you know, Dwight Moody said, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, so, <laughs> so <laughs> this, this act, it was an act of love. You know, this story is told in all four gospels and it's a little different in each of them, but in all of them, Jesus defends Mary and says, leave her alone, leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing. Leave her alone. She's anointed me for my burial. You know, uh, Mary was about the only one that did what was appropriate, given six days before Jesus was going to offer his life. Jesus knew what he was up against. Mary had some sense in her heart as a deep worshiper that something was going on that required an extravagant act of love, and she gave it. She did it. And Jesus said, leave her alone. Stop, get your, put your calculator away, Judas. She's done a beautiful thing here for me. And Jesus de- defends her. And, uh, you know, there's a lot in the Bible about aromas, you know. I tell you what, when we, we're reading through Leviticus, and it talks about all the sacrifices, there's the phrase that gets repeated over and over as I read through Leviticus is the aroma. The aroma of the sacrifice is mentioned over and over again. It's something that's pleasing to God, the aroma. In 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul says, we're the aroma of Christ to God. For among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one it's a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance of life to life. That we bear the, we're the fragrance of Christ in the world. For some, that's, a, that's, a, that's the sweet smell of life. And for some, that's the stench of death. It attracts some people. It repels some people. Okay? But, but we're the aroma of, of Christ. And so Mary's act of devotion and worship is defended. But then it talks about Lazarus. 
And what it says about Lazarus is, after this happened, other people came looking in. It's a dinner party. They weren't invited, but they come look. They wanted to see Lazarus, and they wanted to see Jesus. They're looking in the door here, and they, 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 they want to see what's going on. And the religious leaders decided at that moment, we, don't, we need not only to kill Jesus, we need to kill Lazarus too. Why'd they want to kill Lazarus? He'd already, you know, hey, Jesus could just raise him up again. You know, he could, he could go, for a, go for a repeat. Well, Lazarus' life was living proof of the authenticity of Jesus. His life was the living proof that Jesus is who he said he is, that he's the Messiah. And I think uh, as we read this, church, we need to be Marthas, doing practical things that we know for the cause of Jesus. We need to be ready to be a Mary that pours out in an unlogical way, just devotion and love to Jesus. And I think we're also called to be Lazarus. That when you see my life, it's not supposed to make sense apart from the living presence of Jesus. Your life is not supposed to make sense to the world apart from the transforming power of, of Jesus. And I, I, I like that he gets us, that's fine. But there's even a bigger message we can proclaim that he doesn't just get us, he transforms us. He changes us. He shapes us. And he gives us a new fragrance. And let me tell you what, in just six days, Jesus is going to be covered with blood, sweat, and tears. But that's going to reactivate the smell of the nard that's on him on the cross. As Jesus is on the cross, he can still smell that perfume that Mary poured out on his feet. Would you stand with me, please? Lord God, we thank you for an extravagant act of worship. Didn't make sense, didn't make people comfortable. It was just the only thing she could do. Lord, help us to worship you in this season. Self, in a self-forgetful, sacrificial, intentional way. Whether we're Mary's or Martha's, we can all be a Lazarus. <laughs> Our lives being a living testimony to the transforming power of Jesus. In your holy name we pray, amen.